All right, more criticisms of mean variance optimization, diversified by asset class. So allocations may be diversified by asset class, but not by risk factors, right? So it's an alternative way of looking at things. So we talked about risk factors in the past, so review some of those readings if you're unfamiliar with the term, but I imagine you probably are by now. So what we can do to try and correct for that is a factor-based allocation, okay? So we're gonna use these standard factors that we've been using all along. So we typically start with a market risk premium, just like the cap M does, but then we may include um, a size risk premium, right? So small caps tend to outperform large caps, even after you control for the beta. Value stocks tend to outperform growth stocks in the data, so we can create a risk factor for that. We can also look for a factor for momentum and reversals. And then we can also include some other things, uh, you know, from the bond market, liquidity, duration, credit, uh, other things, volatility, whatever risk factors we want to put in there. And so the idea here is that each one of these factors captures, ideally, um, a slice of the risk puzzle that's unique to that factor. So what we're looking for is we're looking for correlation among these risk factors to actually be lower between the factors than we typically see with correlation between asset classes. So whenever we identify a new factor that we feel does a good job explaining the cross-section of asset returns, well, its value is in its fact that it covers a piece of the risk puzzle that had not been covered before. So the idea here is that these are each unique risk factors capturing a piece of that um, piece of that puzzle, like I said, and they're not correlated with each other. They're sort of each their own independent factor. All right, so if we want to build a factor-based portfolio, each risk factor has a risk premium. In other words, whether we're talking about a um, value versus growth factor or a size factor or a market risk premium factor or a duration factor, each one of them gets a risk premium. So if your portfolio is taking on um, more risk in terms of duration, let's say if we're talking about a fixed income portfolio, then we can calculate and figure out what a risk premium should be for that amount of duration. So we're going to have a risk premium, a standard deviation, and a set of correlations for each one of those risk factors. And so mean variance optimization can, it generates an efficient frontier of risk factors and then gives associated allocations to those risk factors. So the idea at the end of the day, the optimization we're going to run is going to be very much the same. It's just that instead of taking asset classes, now we're using risk factors. So when we do that, we're going to create these long, short factor portfolios, and we can use them to obtain the desired outcomes. In other words, for example, if we were looking at credit exposure, okay, that risk factor and that long, short factor portfolio may tell us, okay, we take a long position in credit risky bonds and a short position in credit risk free bonds. So that, that allows us to capture that risk premium. If we're looking at a valuation factor, we go long value and short growth, right? That's a very common one. Again, that Fama French three-factor model, that HML factor, high minus low, high book to market, high book to market value stocks, you short low book to market growth stocks. Now, how about risk budgeting? So the term risk budgeting, the idea here is that we're going to define risk in ways relevant to the portfolio. In other words, sort of figure out how we're allocating the risk as we go, as we allocate weight to our different asset classes. So if we're doing active risk budgeting, the idea here is that we're looking at the deviations from the portfolio's benchmark and how much extra risk do they add. So if we do this at the overall allocation level, then we're talking about deviations from the strategic asset allocation. And if we're doing this at the individual asset class level, well, then we're talking about deviation from the assets in that asset class in the benchmark. So if we're looking at, let's say, um, domestic stocks. We have, let's say, data from a stock index that we're saying that serves as our proxy for that. If we're going to do this risk budgeting at that asset class level of domestic stocks, well, then we're saying, okay, if we're deviating from that index in the construction of, um, of that asset class, okay, so what does that do for the riskiness of our portfolio? So it's really just another way of discussing the passive and active spectrum. So we can say, we're just going to allocate based on uh, the results of our optimization, right? Just sort of take that as given, or are we gonna allow ourselves uh, some ability to deviate from those allocations with the idea towards, uh, with the idea meaning that we wanna work our way towards gathering some extra alpha. Okay, so one way to do this, the process. We're going to specify the total acceptable risk and allocate it, okay? So the goal here is that if we have a certain risk budget, right, let's say we have a certain standard deviation that we don't feel we want to go above, all right? What we want to do then is figure out how to allocate that standard deviation so that we bump up against that level, don't go above it, while at the same time maximizing the return for each unit of risk 
that we're using, okay? So we're gonna do a couple calculations here. The idea here is that we're gonna start with zero and sort of work our way up to our acceptable risk level. And so along the way, we wanna figure out, okay, what is the marginal contribution of risk? And so by doing that, if we figure out each uh, sort of change we make as we build up the portfolio from the ground up, how much risk are we adding and how much excess return are we getting out of this? So by doing that, by sort of making the right choices, the ones that give us the most bang for our buck, so to speak, the most excess return um, per unit of risk, well then, that's how we work our way towards an optimal portfolio. Okay, so as we do this, let's define two terms. Let's start with MCTR, Marginal Contribution to Portfolio Risk. What that's going to be, that's going to be the change in the total portfolio risk for a small change in allocation to asset class I. So mathematically, that's going to be the beta of asset class I with respect to the portfolio multiplied by the total portfolio standard deviation. So if I have an asset class that has a higher beta, well, then it's going to have a higher marginal contribution to portfolio risk, right? So no big surprise there, right, is that, you know, our portfolio risk is made up of the riskiness of the assets that's in, that are in the portfolio. So if I have an asset class that has a higher amount of risk, it's going to have a higher marginal contribution to the risk of the portfolio. Then I can go from that number to the absolute contribution. Well, once I solve for the MCTR of every asset class in the portfolio, if I take that and I multiply it by the weight that it actually carries in the portfolio, well, then that gives us the absolute contribution to portfolio risk. Now, if those two terms didn't exactly ring out with resonance uh, as I went through them, we want to put these to some numbers and hopefully that'll be make it more clear for you. So let's take a look at this. If we want to calculate return to risk, well, we typically think of this as excess of a function of excess return. Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to take excess return divided by the marginal contribution to total risk. And so what are we looking to do there? We want to maximize that, right? We, obviously, we want to get the most excess return we can get out of each unit that's a marginal contribution to total risk in the portfolio. Excess return is what? A rate of return for that asset class above the risk-free rate. Okay? So when we get to the optimal portfolio, what's going to happen is that by reaching that point of optimality, it means that the ratios of all excess return to MCTRs across each asset class they're now equal, and it turns out then by definition, the math's going to work out so that it will equal the portfolio sharp ratio. All right, so let's do an illustration of this, okay? So we've got a portfolio that has three asset classes, equities, bonds, and cash. We've got their weights, 60, 30, and 10. Their excess return, right? So their rate of return above the risk-free assets. So cash is going to have an excess return of zero because we think of cash as our proxy for some risk-free asset that's out there. Bonds have an excess return. Equities have an even higher excess return. And their betas go correspondingly. Okay, so we have our portfolio. has a 5% expected excess return and a beta of equal to 1. Okay, so the betas are the betas for the asset classes with respect to the portfolio. Total portfolio standard deviation, 12%. All right, so what we want to demonstrate here now by using marginal contribution to total risk, absolute contribution to total risk, and the Sharpe ratio, determine that the portfolio is optimal. Okay, so let's see how the numbers work out. We say it's optimal right there at the top. Well, we probably should prove that. All right, so let's start by finding the MCTR for equities. So what do we do? Like we said, we're going to take the beta for equities in this case, 1.3, and multiply it by the portfolio standard deviation. That gives us 15.6%. Okay, so now what we can do is calculate that ratio of excess return to MCTR. So the excess return of equities was 6.5%. The um, MCTR was 15.6, as we just calculated. So that gives us a ratio of excess return to MCTR of 0.417, okay? Now, if I do the same thing with bonds, okay, bonds had a lower beta, 0.732. So they're going to have a lower marginal contribution to total risk, but they also had a lower excess return. And so we want to make sure that that ratio of excess return to MCTR matches up. And sure enough, it does there as well, right? The excess return of 3.66 divided by the MCTR gets us to that same value, okay? And so this is what we're trying to prove here. If we've hit the point of optimality, in other words, the set of weights that gets us to exactly an optimal portfolio, then each one of these calculations is going to work out to be exactly the same. So 
What did we also say? We said that these ratios of excess return to MCTR should not only be equal, they should equal the portfolio sharp ratio. And so if we take the total excess return of 5% divided by the standard deviation of 12%, what does that give us? It gets us to exactly the same place there. And so we can see here that we end up getting the same value for all three. And what that tells us is that we are at our point of optimality. Okay, some final points here. All right, let's calculate the absolute contribution to total risk, okay? So remember, what did we do there? We take the marginal contribution and we multiply it by the actual weight that it carries in the portfolio. So if we look in that top line there, if we look at equities, equities carry a 60% weight. We calculated the MCTR as being 15.6%, multiply that number by the 0.6 weight, and so we get the absolute contribution to total risk, 9.36%. If we do this for each asset class, what's going to happen is we add up those numbers and it's going to get us exactly to the standard deviation of the portfolio. So we do the same thing for bonds, 30% times the MCTR of 8.78, that gets us 2.64. Cash has no excess return. And uh, so as a result, uh, it had no marginal contribution to total risk. It had no risk, no excess return. So its ACTR is zero add those numbers together, we're gonna to get exactly the portfolio standard deviation. So all of these things tie together to prove that we have hit an optimal point with this set of portfolio allocations and their respective weights.